So, uh, let us continue our discussion of uh, Noether's theorem. So, uh, we have uh, if you recall we succeeded in showing that uh, associated with a continuous symmetry of the Lagrangian there is a conserved quantity and that conserved quantity is called Noether's constant and uh, it may be written in this way. So, so we have successfully showed that Noether's constant uh, has an expression uh, in terms of the Lagrangian and uh, uh, how the generalized coordinates change with respect to the symmetry transformation. So, that is uh, dq by ds would be that whereas, the Lagrangian the uh, um, generalized uh, velocities will be involved uh, next to that uh, rate of change. So, bottom line is that uh, the knowledge of the Lagrangian together with the transformation that leaves the Lagrangian unchanged is sufficient for you to uh, uh, sufficient to allow you to construct explicitly the conserved quantity associated with that symmetry. So, now let me give you some examples uh, that uh, that will convince you that of the usefulness of this idea. But before I do that, uh, I want to uh, point out that it is very uh, necessary for the symmetry in question to be continuous in the sense that there should be a continuous variable called s when you uh, continuously change that variable. So, the uh, generalized coordinates continuously change with respect to that variable. It is only when that happens can you differentiate with respect to s. So, remember that this q involves d by d s of uh, the generalized coordinate. So, implying therefore, that q at the very least is a continuous function of s. Uh, okay. So, uh, bottom line is uh, that uh, there has to be a continuous symmetry. But the question is uh, why cannot you have a discrete symmetry also leading to a conserved quantity? Well, perhaps you can uh, and uh, that will be an accident, uh, but the fundamental reason why uh, this particular formalism does not allow you to make such a statement is because you see if you take a discrete symmetry such as uh, uh, L uh, Lagrangian which is unchanged if you flip the sign of the generalized coordinate of the generalized velocity uh, that is certainly a symmetry and it is a discrete symmetry because you are just uh, changing the sign of. Uh, so, you either change or you do not change so that is a discrete symmetry, but then that does not uh, obviously lead to any conserved quantity because in this particular way of thinking about it you need something to differentiate with. So, you need to you need to start with an assertion such as d by d s of l equals 0. So, there is no a continuous parameter there. So, because of that discrete symmetries uh, are not part of this discussion. Okay. So, let me go ahead and uh, explain to you uh, some or uh, point out some interesting applications of this Noether's theorem. So, imagine uh, I have a Lagrangian of a point particle subject to a central force. So, that is what I have described in this equation. So, you have a Lagrangian subject to a central force directed towards the origin. So, now I want to ask myself uh, what is the symmetry of this Lagrangian. There are many symmetries, one of them uh, is what I am going to discuss and the specific symmetry I have, I have in mind is the symmetry that rotates the position vector by a certain certain angle about some axis. So, basically that uh, that sort of a rotation is obviously captured by this uh, kind of an orthogonal transformation. So, that means it is replaced by R subscript S where S is continuous and that R subscript S is basically an orthogonal matrix called capital M subscript S right. So, times position vector. So, I am going to assume this is an orthogonal matrix. So, if you recall an orthogonal matrix is uh, something whose uh, transpose is its inverse is not it. So, uh, I have an orthogonal matrix here. Okay. So, this would be the most general sort of rotation that you can think of. So, for some general orthogonal matrix this would correspond to some general rotation. So, now uh, obviously this m s is a function of s but not of time. So, that means uh, at a given time you 
rotate all the position vectors that uh, maybe if you have just one particle there is nothing else but if you have more than one particle you are supposed to rotate all of them. So, um, in this particular example there is only one position vector. So, uh, therefore, the velocity vector is just going to be the time derivative which is uh, uh, given by this and uh, since m is orthogonal the velocity changes but the speed does not change okay because the speed is the square of the velocity vector and the square of the velocity vector involves uh, you know so if you remember uh, rs dot squared is nothing but r m transpose m r okay so uh, it's r m transpose m r isn't it so that is this is nothing but 1 so this is r r so which is r squared so so in other words uh, velocity changes uh, r dot becomes r dot subscript s but the square of the velocity does not change because uh, it is an orthogonal transformation. So uh, given that the square does not change and the magnitude of r s for similar reason does not change which is uh, this r without a bold face is basically the magnitude of the position vector. So, that does not change and the velocity uh, square does not change which is the speed square. So, that means the Lagrangian is unchanged with respect to this transformation. So, now you, you, you see that this is a continuous transformation which uh, preserves the Lagrangian. So, if it does then you can see that uh, there is a Noether's theorem guarantees that there is a conserved quantity and that conserved quantity is precisely this. So, it is a rate of change of the position vector with respect to uh, the continuous parameter s uh, times the generalized uh, generalized momentum as it were T L by D R dot is the generalized momentum right. So, now the question is uh, well this is not particularly illuminating. So, I want to uh, given that this L has this particular specific form. I want to be able to explicitly write this in terms of uh, the um, functions that are present in L. So, in order to do that, uh, so you see dl by dr dot by definition and construction it only is just uh, m times r dot ok. So, there is nothing important there. So, that is why I have written m times r dot it is just the momentum. So, now uh, what I am going to do is that uh, I have to now uh, commit myself to a specific uh, form of this orthogonal transformation. So, that orthogonal transformation now is going to be represented by a rotation by a certain angle about some fixed axis. So, I am going to assume that the axis that of rotation that I am going to think of is fixed and that is determined by a unit vector called n, n hat. So, the n hat is the fixed axis about which I am going to rotate and uh, but the angle th through which I rotate is my variable that continuous uh, transformation that I was talking about that continuous variable that I am going to select is basically the angle of rotation about this fixed axis ok. So, the axis is fixed but the amount of rotation is a variable which is s ok. So, if that is the uh, case then uh, obviously I can write this r vector as uh, a component uh, a projection of r along n cap and this is uh, the rest of it. So, r, r parallel is defined as the projection of r vector along the unit vector n hat and r perpendicular is uh, whatever else is remaining in r. So, once you subtract out r parallel from r whatever is remaining is r perpendicular. So, if that is the case then you can see that uh, as I do the rotation r parallel will not change because it is parallel to the axis of rotation. So, that vector will not change. So, so if I put a subscript s it is the perpendicular vector which changes but the parallel vector does not change. But now so as a result if I uh, since uh, Noether's theorem uh, calls for the finding the derivative of r s with respect to s you see that this uh, this derivative with respect to s drops out because it does not depend on s. So, there is only a derivative of r perpendicular with respect to s. So, you see you have a, a axis and you are rotating by some angle s ok. 
and you have an r perpendicular which is pointing like this ok. So, that r perpendicular is your function of s and that is going round and round as you rotate it. So, now how do you describe a vector that is going round and round uh, by some angle s and this is how you would describe it right. So, if s is the amount by which it this vector twists in the plane perpendicular to n cap. So, that twisting is determined by this uh, obvious orthogonal transformation. So, given this, uh, this uh, construction it is easy to see that the rate of change of r. So, you see the, uh, the plane perpendicular to n hat uh, is a plane. So, vectors in a plane has to be described using a basis so, and I have selected some arbitrary basis called E1, E1 hat and E2 hat and uh, so these are mutually perpendicular basis vectors uh, which are lying in the plane perpendicular to n hat. So, uh, and r 1 is basically the component of r perpendicular, uh, r perpendicular comma 1 means the uh, component of r perpendicular along this E 1 cap which is arbitrarily chosen. So, bottom line is that uh, having chosen it then uh, this, the, this sort of a rotation implies that the rate of change of r perpendicular uh, which is parallel to E 1 is uh, basically r perpendicular parallel to E 2 and so on for similarly for uh, the derivative with respect to r 2. Now, we go back and try to uh, write down the rate of change of this with respect to s, but uh, notice that this continues to drop out because the rate of change does not involve s and only this is there ok. So, r, r s perpendicular is nothing but r 1 perpendicular e, e 1 hat plus r 2 perpendicular e 2 hat. So, that is what I have done, but then the rate of changes will involve this with a minus sign ok. So, you can easily convince yourself that this is what it is. Now, I go ahead and substitute uh, this expression all the way there ok and uh, I go ahead and uh, substitute uh, this here ok. So, as usual uh, you see because uh, r s perpendicular is in the plane uh, which is perpendicular to n cap. So, and it is being dot producted with uh, r, r s dot I have to ensure that only uh, components of r s which are uh, perpendicular to n cap are involved. So, which is why there is no n cap component. So, it is uh, r s is of will have n cap also, but then I have ignored that the r parallel part will drop out because uh, that. Uh, so, even though it is in principle there, but when you take dot product with respect to this which is in a plane perpendicular to n cap it drops out. So, I have just decided not to include that for brevity alright. So, the moment you take this dot product you end up getting this and this is nothing but the uh, uh, component of the angular momentum right in the minus n cap direction. So, you can easily convince yourself that uh, this q the Noether constant is nothing but the uh, component of the angular momentum of the particle in the, in the direction of minus n cap. But then keep in mind that n cap was any uh, it is fixed, but then it can it is arbitrary it can be anything anything which is fixed. So, if it is anything then obviously, if q is constant uh, that is going to happen only if r cross p itself is constant not necessarily along any particular uh, axis, but uh, in general. So, it is only when r cross p is actually fully constant and this makes sense ok. So, uh, bottom line is that you see Noether's theorem very beautifully connects the concept of rotational symmetry to a conserved quantity namely angular momentum. So, we all know that angular momentum is conserved in a central force uh, situation, but what uh, this theorem uh, very elegantly shows is that this conservation law has a deeper origin namely that deep origin is the fact that your Lagrangian is unchanged with respect to a certain continuous symmetry and this continuous symmetry is the rotational symmetry. Alright, so this is one very nice example. So, now I am going to discuss uh, uh, I am just going to mention that it is possible to rework this idea in the context of Hamiltonians because if you recall we discussed something called flows earlier and that is going to be useful now. 
So that uh, the concept of flows uh, in the context of Hamiltonian mechanics was introduced at here. So I'm going to make use of that now. So now just like it was in the Lagrangian case, uh, a continuous symmetry is postulated which leaves now the Hamiltonian un unchanged just as the earlier case it was a Lagrangian that was unchanged. So now I am going to uh, postulate that there is a symmetry that leaves the Hamiltonian unchanged. So if the Hamiltonian is unchanged you can see that uh, the uh, uh, d by ds of h changes. So that means even though uh, the generalized momentum p and generalized coordinate q change with respect to the continuous parameter s, the Hamiltonian itself does not. So now how would you go about evaluating the rate of change of the Hamiltonian with respect to this continuous parameter? So you would, uh, you would basically do it successively. So h depends on s uh, through p and q. So you first differentiate h with respect to q, then differentiate q with respect to s, then you differentiate h with respect to p and then differentiate p with respect to s. But then now comes the really important step where we make use of the earlier idea of flows. So remember that uh, we had decided that I can think of uh, this change with respect to s as a kind of a flow. So if that, if that is a flow then a flow has a generator which I call g. So the generator of the flow obeys these Hamilton equations. So the Hamilton's equations were usually if s was time, okay. So but in this particular case uh, s is that con any continuous variable which corresponds to a symmetry. So given that fact that you can see that uh, the Hamilton's equation uh, for this flow can be written like this for a suitable generator. So if that is the case then you can go ahead and substitute that here. Right? And then you will see that uh, this is writable as, so the rate of change of h with respect to s is nothing but the Poisson bracket of h with, res uh, with the generator of uh, this symmetry. So uh, given that h is unchanged under the symmetry, what this implies is that uh, the Poisson bracket of the Hamiltonian and the generator is 0. So what this uh, statement says is that if there is a symmetry there should be a generator which has a 0 Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian. But now keep in mind that uh, the rate of change of g with respect to um, time, now time means the actual time, the dynamical uh, parameter which describes the sequence of events. So uh, as opposed to s which can be some abstract continuous parameter which correspond to some symmetries. So now the, the time rate of change of the generator or any other operator for that matter or any other uh, state function is always writable as rate of change of that with respect to uh, time is uh, the Poisson bracket of that quantity with the Hamiltonian. Now uh, we have successfully shown that for a symmetry the, that Poisson bracket is actually 0. But if it is 0, so what combining these two ideas uh, allows us to conclude that this generator of the symmetry is in fact uh, not only does it generate those symmetries, it is also independent of time. So as a result it is the constant, it is a constant of the motion. So now I am going to allow you to uh, convince yourself that in the case of this rotations that we discussed in the earlier example the generator of rotations is no, nothing but the appropriate component of the angular momentum. So then you will be, you'll be able to show that just like we did earlier, it is the angular momentum about any uh, axis which is uh, a constant of the motion. So, so in the Hamiltonian setting it appears as the generator of uh, the rotational symmetry. The, the angular momentum appears or makes its presence felt as the generator of rotational symmetry. So now I am going to uh, discuss something which is somewhat less familiar to many people and certainly it was unfamiliar to me when many years ago I l learned it on my own and it is an idea that is not often discussed properly in many books and that is the concept of dynamical symmetries. And the reason is of course because uh, the number of such examples are also somewhat limited 
and uh, in fact i i can only think of one example in the present situation and that is the conservation of what is called the runge lens vector right so it's called the rl lr laplace runge lens vector so i'll tell you what that is so you see the idea is that if you recall earlier just a while back we were talking about central forces so central forces are basically forces uh, acting on a given particle which are directed towards some origin so bottom line is that the functional form of that force or potential is uh, can be anything so even though that's not specified irrespective of that we were successful in concluding that that implies that there is a vector quantity that is conserved and that's the angular momentum so regardless of what the nature of the force is so long as it's central uh, the angular momentum vector is in fact a conserved quantity but now if specifically in addition to the central nature of the force imagine it had some other quality namely that it was actually a coulombic force that means that it obeyed inverse square law the force uh, dies off as inversely proportional to the square of the distance so if it's not just central force but also a coulomb force or a, you know the newtonian gra gravitational force both of which have this 1 by r squared form so if that is the case then uh, what we are going to show is that in addition to the angular momentum there is another conserved quantity called the laplace runge lens vector and that is very unique to the inverse squared type of force it's not a conserved quantity if the force had any other functional dependence so imagine that uh, instead of 1 by r if the force was 1 by uh, instead of the potential being 1 by r the potential was an 1 by r squared then immediately uh, Laplace Lunge lens vector or there is no other conserved quantity other than angular momentum and total energy. So uh, bottom line is that uh, so this is uh, this symmetry is called a dynamical symmetry for reasons I am going to get to shortly. So bottom line we are, what we are trying to find out is that given the fact that you can easily verify that this peculiar object called the Laplace Lunge lens vector which is defined in this way. So you see A is called the Laplace Runge lens vector, LRL vector. So that's defined in this peculiar way. So imagine that the force acting on the particle is uh, minus some constant called K divided by R squared and it's directed towards the origin. So that means K, K by R squared is the strength of the force and the direction is minus R hat. So it's directed towards the origin. Then I am uh, entitled to define a uh, quantity called LRL vector which is defined in this fashion. So it is uh, linear momentum cross product angular momentum minus mass times that constant k in the r hat direction. So this is uh, a very peculiar rather arbitrary looking uh, definition of a, a yet to be understood vector called LRL vector. So it is not at all clear why we would invoke something like this. So the reason for that is that it is easy to show that this is a conserved quantity. Firstly, even before that, it is immediately obvious that um, this A has nothing to do with L in the sense that A and L are not the same at least. I mean, it has something to do with L, but A is completely different from L. It is not, so the conservation of L does not necessarily imply conservation of A for example because there is a P sitting next to the L which is certainly not conserved. Linear momentum is not conserved because there is a force acting which is the central force. So there is no guarantee that A has to be conserved simply because L is conserved. L, L is conserved because of rotational symmetry. So there is no guarantee A should be conserved but in fact for the uh, specific Coulomb force or the Newton's 1 by r squared force A is indeed conserved. So in order to prove that what we do is we find the rate of change of A with respect to time and you will be able to see that you can uh, write that rate of change uh, in this fashion. See firstly uh, you see uh, the rate of change of P cross L is uh, the rate of change of P with respect to time which is the force which is this one and L which is r cross P. But then I am not going to write a P cross dl by dt because you all know that 0 because dl by dt is 0 because L is conserved. 
but then I also have to write this. So, uh, so you see r hat is nothing but uh, r divided by r vector, okay, r vector divided by r. So, that is what I have done, I have done uh, differentiate 1 by 1 and I will get this, okay. So, if I differentiate r and if I differentiate uh, r I get this, if I differentiate um, r raised to this, right. So, this will become minus 1 r raised to minus 2 dr by dt and but then uh, dr by dt is nothing but uh, 2 r dr by dt is nothing but uh, right uh, 2 r dot dr by dt. So, like that uh, I will be able to rewrite it in this way, okay. So, um, bottom line is that uh, if I uh, take this out, right, so that, so that there is a triple product, the, this is a vector triple product which you can expand like this. So, yeah, there are some steps you have to go through, it is not that obvious. In fact, it is not obvious that is the reason why I am discussing it because uh, it is not at all obvious that there should be a vector like A which is conserved because it is pretty much most of the time not a conserved quantity. It is conserved quantity only for central forces that have the form of 1 by r squared force. If that was anything else, it is not conserved. So, now the vector triple product is writable in this way and you can see that when you expand this out. Uh, all terms cancel out in pairs and you get 0, okay. And the last result follows from the observation that uh, this p is nothing but mass times velocity. So, uh, bottom line is now, uh, so I have succeeded in convincing you that there exists a vector called A which is unrelated to L in the sense that uh, the conservation of L does not guarantee conservation of A. Uh, so, that these two distinct uh, vectors L and A and both of which are conserved. So, now the question is we have successfully pinpointed the symmetry that is responsible for the conservation of L and that is the rotational symmetry. Now, similarly we want to know what is the symmetry responsible for the conservation of A. So, that is a perfectly valid question which uh, we are now going to answer. Okay, so the uh, answer to that question is the following. So, I am going to think of uh, the generator of uh, the symmetry responsible for conserving A to be this uh, some function of uh, this Ax and Ay, where Ax and Ay are the x and y components of this Runge lens vector, okay. Okay, so, we might be wondering what is x, what is y. So, of course, uh, the answer is the following that you see uh, the angular momentum right points in a fixed direction because it is conserved, it is points in a fixed direction. Now, I think of that fixed direction as my z axis. So, the x and y directions are perpendicular to that angular momentum direction, okay. So, given that you can define x and y in that precise way. Uh, so, it makes sense to talk of Ax and Ay. So, Ax and Ay are the x and y components of the Laplace Runge lens vector, okay. Okay, so I am further going to say that this alpha is defined as tan inverse Ay by Ax. So, so in other words, what I have done here is that I have postulated that G is the generator of some symmetry. So, where uh, G is defined as inverse tan of Ay by Ax. Now, given that this is a, a the definition of this generator, now I want to see what sort of a conserved quantity this generator entails, means what, what conserved quantity does it lead to. So, uh, because uh, G is a generator of a symmetry, it should uh, the transformation that is uh, uh, the, the putative symmetry that we are talking about, the symmetry that this uh, transformation implies should uh, certainly obey this these equations. So, these are the flow equations uh, for uh, with respect to this generator. So, dx by ds is therefore equal to the uh, generator's derivative with respect to px. Similarly, uh, 
Px itself uh, will evolve with respect to that continuous parameter and so on and so forth. So now, given that alpha is tan inverse Ay by Ax, we can go ahead and uh, and keep in mind that Ax and Ay can be explicitly written out because we know that uh, a, a, we know the definition of A is P cross L minus M K R cap. So we can explicitly write down Ax and Ay, which is what I've done here. So this is the explicit uh, construction for Ax and Ay, and uh, given this, uh, we can go ahead and uh, evaluate this uh, these flow transformations. Okay. So, so you can see that, uh, okay, so, so you can see that uh, first of all that Hamiltonian description of uh, Noether's theorem guarantees that this G uh, is a conserved quantity, okay. So, if G is a conserved quantity, then it is, it is clear that the, the symmetry which, uh, which is responsible for conserving G, okay is basically this dynamical symmetry. It is called a dynamical symmetry because you see this, this symmetry actually mixes uh, momentum and position. So see in the earlier case, the uh, you could uh, at a given time just rotate the position and it really does not do anything. The momentum components do not get mixed up with the position components where the different position components get mixed up when you rotate. But here it is not like that. The value of the position after rotation depends upon not only the components of the position before rotation, they also depend on the components of the momentum before rotation. So, it, see earlier in the case of uh, just ordinary physical rotation, the components after rotation, the position components after rotation depended only on the position components before rotation. But here it is not, it is dynamical because the uh, position components after rotation not only depend on the position components before rotation like, like it is the case in the uh, case of physical rotation, but in the case of this dynamical type of symmetry that uh, the momentum components also get mixed up. So, it is a whole mix of uh, the components of momentum, linear momentum, position components and so on and so forth. So, they all get mixed up and give you the answers for the position vector and momentum vector after rotation. So, that is the reason why it is called dynamical symmetry. Okay, so, I will uh, I'll allow you to think about this and uh, in, in the next class, I will discuss uh, the symmetries in field theory. So, in other words, so till now I have only talked about systems with just one, uh, I mean a few degrees of freedom like 3 degrees of freedom or 2 degrees of freedom, so just point particle in a central force. But uh, this title of this course is Dynamics of Classical and Quantum Fields. So, I have to quickly come back to discussing fields. So, I am that is the intention right now. So, in the next class, I am going to tell you how to invoke Noether's theorem in the context of uh, fields. So, you can also invoke the uh, Noether's theorem in the context of fields and go ahead and derive conserved quantities in field theory by staring at symmetry. That is actually even more powerful than it is in the case of point particles because conserved quantities in field theories are even harder to guess compared to uh, point particle theories. So, but however, symmetries continue to be somewhat easy to guess both in the case of point particles as well as uh, field theories. So, uh, that is a boon because then we can use that to generate uh, conserved quantities even in field theory. So, I am going to stop here and hope you will join me for the next class which is all about uh, symmetries and conserved quantities in field theories. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.